In Doctrine and Covenants 85, Joseph Smith writes to William Phelps about how to handle recent events in relation to the Law of Consecration. Some Latter-day Saints had moved to Missouri to live according to the Law of Consecration, but without specific authorization to do so. It was not a decision that one could decide on one's own. One needed to be called to move to Missouri and live the law. Some, who were already in Missouri, weren't living up to the Law of Consecration like William McClellan, who refused to deed his land to the bishop, Edward Partridge. The prophet laid out instructions for what to do according to what he called the still small voice. My name is Joseph Stewart. I'm the public communications specialist at the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship at BYU. And with Janice Johnson, a Willis Center Research Associate at the Institute, we will be discussing each week's block of reading from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints Come Follow Me curriculum. We aren't here to present a lesson but rather to hit on a few key things from the scripture block that we believe will help fulfill the Maxwell Institute's mission to inspire and fortify Latter-day Saints in their testimonies of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ and to engage the world of religious ideas. Hi, Janice. How are you? I'm good. Thanks. Glad to hear it. So in verse 3, Joseph Smith speaks about tithing. What do you think about that? Well, I think that sometimes this is a test of how careful a reader we are. We may read it and say, oh, I know what this is. I know what tithing is and not think twice about it. But if we think about the date, and this is, the date is 1832, November of 1832. Tithing as we know it isn't revealed until we get to section 119, which is in 1838. And so I think that we actually have to think about this, what the Lord means. I suspect that this means a general donation, the offerings that the Lord asks of each of us. Of course, the word tithing itself reflects 10%, but tithe in the early church was used in a very general sense prior to the revealing of the law of tithing as we know it today. And that is crucial to remember that the Lord reveals things line upon line, precept upon precept, and that as those who hold keys receive more information, they will be able to pass on that information through revelation to us. Now, I love that Joseph Smith speaks about hearing the still small voice, but I confess I'm not the type of person that has those sorts of spiritual experiences by the still small voice or the sort of burning of the bosom type rhetoric. There are many, many ways of recognizing the promptings of the Holy Ghost. And in Preach My Gospel, there's an entire chapter that I would recommend on how do I feel the Spirit and how do I help others to feel the Spirit? Let's not limit ourselves to saying we have to hear the still small voice while we can still be grateful that Joseph Smith heard a still small voice for himself. I would say for myself, if I heard a voice in my head, I might think that I was having some mental health issues. That's not the way that the Lord speaks to me. But I have friends who hear something that is audible to them. For me, revelation often comes in phrases or words. But I think as we look at the Doctrine and Covenants, we get a multiplicity of models of how revelation might be received. And I think the model that we get here perhaps gives us something to chew on. So verse 6 says, Yea, thus saith the still small voice. Elder Packer used to say, you feel it more than you hear it. And maybe feeling it works for more of us. Which whispereth through and pierceth all things. The piercing, the Book of Mormon when the Father speaks and introduces Christ in 3 Nephi 11, it pierced them to their souls. It pierced their hearts. And often at times it makes my bones to quake while it maketh manifest. And even within this one verse, we've got a range of different ways that someone might receive revelation and receive communication from the Lord. And I think that that's really important particularly as each of us learns the process and learns the pattern of how God speaks to us individually. President Julie B. Beck, former president of the General Relief Society, would agree with you, as would I. In a sermon called, And upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit, 
She says, the ability to qualify for, receive, and act on personal revelation is the single most important skill that can be acquired in this life. Now, she doesn't go on to say, this is exactly how you receive revelation. But the ability to qualify for, receive, and act on revelation being the single most important skill, she suggests to me that we need to figure out how we receive revelation as individuals. Some folks will go to the temple. Some folks will go on a hike. Some folks will be in their closet. Some people need to be in certain locations or talking to certain people. But whatever the process is of receiving revelation for you, I would encourage you with President Beck to find out what it is that works best. I think that very rarely can we speak in such exclusive terms and actually be right. But here, the single most important skill we can learn in mortality is figuring out how God speaks to us. And that is a skill and one that needs to be honed. President Faust used to talk about revelation as an, an old school crystal radio where you had to get the wire in just the right place so that the transmission would be clear. Revelation is like that. And us figuring out where that wire is or how that transmission comes is an essential part of mortality. Now, in verse 8, it talks about steadying the ark. While I think about steadying the ark as referring to Indiana Jones, it actually refers to an Old Testament story where Yusa, an Israelite, seeks to steady the Ark of the Covenant as it's being transported and is immediately struck dead. While that seems a really dramatic example of what it means to steady the Ark, I think that there are a multitude of applications for each of us to consider. I also think it's worth thinking about the Indiana Jones version and the flesh melting off one's face when you study the Ark. But I think that the principle here, Uza and also those involved with the Law of Consecration, Joseph and Edward Partridge are having some differences in terms of how the Law of Consecration is applied. And sometimes well-meaning individuals think that they have a better solution than the Lord does. Now, we hope that the flesh doesn't melt off their face or a shaft of lightning doesn't hit them. But we've got to think ourselves about making sure that we're not trying to steady the ark. Definitely. What person can presume to study the ark, meaning to take it upon ourselves to direct what should be done? As President David O. McKay once said, let us look around and see how quickly men and women who attempt unauthoritatively to steady the ark die spiritually. Now, there's a warning in here that we should respect the spiritual impressions of those who lead us, who have been asked to do so, but it does not say that Uzzah should not have told one of the people carrying the ark <laughs> that they could be doing a little bit better of a job in holding it steady. While we ultimately respect the priesthood keys that govern the church and our individual wards and stakes, I would also argue that we have a responsibility to help those who have been given that great responsibility by doing what we can to assist them in their efforts. And I think actually that leads us well to 86, because section 86, I know you're going to give us some context, Joey, but we see Joseph refining a revelation. And I would argue that revelation is helped by better information. And perhaps that if we see an arc or something that needs to be studied, if we have better information that can help, we can offer that help. Now, when I was a Latter-day Saint missionary, there was a fellow that I served around that wrote to one of my friend's sisters using my name and harassed her. And I did not know this until several weeks later when my friend said, why are you writing weird things to my sister? To which I replied, I have no idea what you're talking about. That ended awkwardly. But then four months later, my mission president called me and said, Elder Stewart, we need you to have an emergency transfer with this particular missionary. And I said to my mission president, I trust your judgment and your revelation, but I just want you to know that this is part of the background that I have had with this missionary. My mission president said, I will call back soon. He called about three minutes later 
and said, Elder Stewart, I have received refined revelation. And I love thinking about this as revelation is something that can be improved upon with more information because in section 86, Joseph Smith has prayed to learn more about the parable of the wheat and the tares. And it's one of those stories that we often take for granted that we understand, but that there is always more information for us to benefit from if we will further seek revelation on our topic. In May of 1831, Joseph Smith began with his translation of the Bible to go over the parables. And here we've got a year later, and this revelation is again revising his own revision of the parable of the wheat and the tares. We have revelation building on revelation. As we look at the manuscript copies of these revelations, we can see edits, we can see that process of revelation being refined. It is also something that is encouraging to me that if I'm doing what I'm supposed to, and I go forward on the revelation that I have, the information that I have, that the Lord will give more to me where it is needed and necessary. That it is up to me to live worthy of the spirit, to act with the best intentions and according to the revelation that I've received, but that I should always leave room that God may direct me to do something else entirely. That's great. Now let's talk about this parable itself. In Joseph's parable, in the revelation that Joseph receives, it's the apostles that sow the wheat. And Satan sows the tares. So that's a little more specificity than what we get from the New Testament version. And then in verse 7, let the wheat and the tares grow together until the harvest is fully ripe. Now, why would we do that? Why would we let the tares grow? The only thing that I can think of is that tares and wheat essentially grow next to each other and around each other. So there's no way that you can fully extract the tares without also taking out wheat. Is that correct? Of course, all of my farming knowledge is based on other people. I grew up in California, and I'm not a farmer. But my dad grew up in southeastern Idaho, and he is the font of most of my farming knowledge. But when wheat and tares are young, they look very similar. And it is impossible to just pull up the tares. If you try to pull up the tares when they are young, you're going to pull up tender wheat also. We have to wait. And as the wheat and the tares mature, it becomes very clear which is which. I suspect that this is a lesson to us about those of us who would judge and try and root out those that we don't think belong. We can all do more to think about how can I help the wheat rather than trying to identify the tares. Now, in section 87, Joseph Smith receives a revelation in response to an inquiry he has about what historians of the United States call the nullification crisis, a battle over states' rights and federal authority, as well as other major terrifying events taking place across the world. And Section 87 constitutes what Joseph Smith calls a revelation on prophecy on war. Now, the thing that sticks out most to me in this section is the commandment to stand ye in holy places and be not moved. After the last year, year and a half that we have all had where we have been in the same place and have not been able to see loved ones and family and be able to explore the beautiful world that God created for us, how do we ensure that it's not just stand ye in the same place, <laughs> but stand in holy places and be not moved from it? What does that mean to you, Janice? When I think about holy places, I think about my home, but I also... I believe that places become holy because of what happens in those places. There are some mundane places that become holy because of experiences that we've had in those places. And I have had experiences that have made an imprint on my soul in places all over the world, but also just in my own home. So what some religious studies scholars will say is that the idea of the sacred is something that is constructed. And what I fear is that many believers, including Latter-day Saints, will say, 
If something is constructed, that means that it cannot be real. Let me emphasize that that is not true. We have spoken already at length about the need to learn to receive revelation for oneself, that we construct different patterns to have opportunities to receive revelation. Now, standing in holy places, as you said, Janice, is often about what takes place in a specific location. So I think about a room upstairs in the Harold B. Lee Library at BYU. I could not find this room. I assume it still exists. It's a classroom in the library. And years ago, David Whitaker, who was over Latter-day Saint manuscripts in special collections at the library, was speaking to this class. I was TAing. And during the class, apart from what was going on in the class, I had a revelation, a question that I had brought before the Lord and had been waiting patiently to receive an answer, and that answer came. I couldn't tell you what Dr. Whitaker taught us that day, but that ground is holy for me because of the truth God taught me in that place. Thank you so much for sharing that, Janice. We're going to close with a similar thought by President Sharon G. Larson. It was Thursday night, mom and dad's regular night to work at the Cardston Temple. I was in my teens like you young women. My grandmother, who was living with us, was away from home at the time, so I would be alone. As they left, dad hugged me and said, Now, Sharon, be in good company. I thought, What's he thinking? Doesn't he know I'll be here by myself? And then I realized that's exactly what he was thinking. Standing in holy places is all about being in good company, whether you're alone or with others. It's being where the Holy Ghost is our companion, alone or in a crowd. When we determine within ourselves that we will control our thoughts and our actions and be the best we can possibly be, the best of life will come to us. A holy place is where we feel safe, secure, loved, and comforted. That's how it was in our heavenly home. Standing in holy places and being in good company bring back feelings and memories of that home we left behind, the home that seems so far away at times. Thank you for listening to this episode of Abide, a Maxwell Institute podcast. Head on over to iTunes or your preferred podcast provider to subscribe, rate, and leave a review, each of which are worth their weight in podcast gold. You can receive show notes, including references to the sermons and articles referenced in this episode, by signing up for the Maxwell Institute newsletter at mi.byu.edu. Please also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube for more content from the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship.